Hello and welcome to NSC News Live from Istanbul. I'm Hera Mustafa and these are the headlines. At least 14 Afghan security personnel have been killed in a Taliban attack on a district police headquarters in the Faryab province. A provincial council member said the police chief for Kassar district is among those killed. He added the Taliban have also taken 37 security personnel as captive. At least 17 people, including children, have been killed in a missile attack on a gas station in eastern Yemen's Marib province. The Marib's governor said dozens of people have been wounded, blaming Houthis for the attack. Meanwhile, Saudi-led Arab coalition says it has intercepted a Houthi drone launch towards the southern city of Hamid's Mushet. However, the rebel group claims to have hit intended targets as Saudi Arabia's King Khalid Air Base in the city. Iraqi military says its air defenses have shot down two drones at the country's Anil Assad air base that hosts U.S. forces. It comes after coalition forces said a U.S.-run diplomatic facility in the Iraqi capital Baghdad was targeted with a rocket strike. No group has claimed responsibility for both attacks. President Joe Biden says the United States does not see conflict with Russia. In an opaque piece for the Washington Post, Biden reiterated Washington's desire for a stable and predictable relationship with Moscow. However, he added that the U.S. will not hesitate to respond to Russia's potential harmful activities. India has reported over 114,000 new coronavirus infections overnight, the lowest in two months. The country has recorded nearly 2,700 deaths in the past 24 hours. Pakistan has registered 76 deaths and more than 1,600 COVID-19 cases in the past 24 hours. Globally, the virus has claimed more than 3.7 million lives and infected over 172 million people. Well, those were the headlines, news in detail. Coming up to the short break, stay with us. Welcome back. Now, the news in detail. At least 14 Afghan security personnel have been killed in a Taliban attack on a district police headquarters in the Faryab province. A provincial council member said the police chief for Kassar district is among those killed. He said the Taliban have also taken 37 security personnel as captive. He added that the police force needs reinforcement as their headquarters is under siege. At least 20 security personnel were reportedly killed yesterday. Violence in Afghanistan has surged in recent months amid the withdrawal of U.S. and NATO troops. The UN officials have called on the Afghan government and Taliban delegations in Doha to discuss the peace process. Under Secretary General for Safety and Security Gilts Mishaw and Special Envoy Deborah Lyons were representing the UN side. The United Nations Assistance Mission in Afghanistan said reduction in violence and safety of UN's aid workers were also discussed. Meanwhile, U.S. Special Envoy Salme Khalilzad will meet with Afghan political leaders and women to discuss peace. The State Department said Khalilzad and the delegation are visiting Kabul, Doha and the region. It added Khalilzad will also meet with leaders from regional countries to discuss the peace process, trade and development. Israeli occupation forces continued their brutal assaults on peaceful protesters in Palestine's West Bank. Palestinians are staging regular protests against the forceful expulsions of families from their homes in Sheikh Jarrah in Silman neighborhoods in eastern Jerusalem. 
Israeli forces also seized Palestinian flags held by protesters and prevented other demonstrations in the neighborhood. They also assaulted the journalist as well as briefly detained an Al Jazeera's correspondent Givara Buderi as she was covering the sit-in. While in Kafur Kadum village, a nine-year-old child was shot with a rubber bullet while dozens suffocated from Israeli forces tear gas shelling. Meanwhile, in Gaza, authorities say they destroyed more than 1,200 unexploded missiles which were fired by Israeli forces during its recent attacks on the blockaded Gaza Strip. While in a report, an NGO said over a million Palestinians have been detained by the Israeli forces since 1967. It said those detainees include more than 17,000 women and staggering over 50,000 children. It said more than 200 Palestinians have died in the Israeli prisons. At least 17 people, including children, have been killed in a missile attack on a gas station in eastern Yemen's Mare province. The Mare's governor said dozens of people have been wounded, blaming Houthis for the attack. He said several cars, including the ambulances that arrived to rush the injured to hospitals, also caught fire. The Houthis have not yet commented on the attack. Meanwhile, Saudi-led Arab coalition says it has intercepted a Houthi drone launched towards the southern city of Khamis Mushed. However, the rebel group claims to have hit intended target as Saudi Arabia's King Khalid Air Base in the city. Earlier, Houthis, a spokesperson said an Omani delegation has arrived in Yemeni capital Sana for peace talks. However, U.S. Special Envoy for Yemen Tim Lender King slammed Houthis and accused them of failing to reach an urgently needed ceasefire. Syrian army has killed 70 militants after they attacked the government forces near Ravaya in Idlib province. The Russian Center for Reconciliation in Syria said one government soldier was killed in the sabotage group's attack. It said two of the Syrian troops were also injured as they returned fire. The center also reported 39 episodes of shelling in the Idlib de-escalation zone by a militant group. Iraqi military says U.S. air defenses have shot down two drones at the country's Al Assad air base that hosts American forces. It comes hours after coalition forces said a U.S.-run diplomatic facility in the Iraqi capital Baghdad was targeted with a rocket strike. In a tweet, coalition forces spokesperson in Iraq, Colonel Wayne Marotta, said the rocket impacted near Baghdad Diplomatic Support Center. He said the attack caused no injuries or damage. No group has claimed responsibility for both the attacks so far. In another development, Iraq and the U.S. agreed on a redeployment plan of coalition troops outside the war-torn country. Meanwhile, northern Iraq's regional officials said three people have been killed in an airstrike on a camp housing thousands of displaced. In Burkina Faso, the number of people killed in a gun attack on a village has risen to 132, including seven children. The UN has condemned the attack and called on countries to step up the fight against violent extremism. Burkina Faso's authorities say armed asylums attacked the Solan village in Yaga province, which borders Niger. Government spokesmen said another 40 residents were also wounded, while the gunmen also burned homes and a market. Burkina Faso's President Rock Mark Christian Kabure called the killings barbaric and urged national unity. No group has claimed responsibility for the attack so far. In Nigeria, at least 88 people have been killed in an attack by armed bandits in restive Kebi state. Police spokesman in the region said an identified gunman conducted attacks in eight areas of the region. He says security forces were dispatched to the region and investigations were launched. Meanwhile, Nigeria's media said armed bandits attacked a vigilante group which was created to assist the security agencies to secure the volatile areas. In April, nine police officers were killed in an attack by gunmen in the state. India has reported over 114,000 new coronavirus infections overnight the lowest in two months. The country has recorded nearly 2,700 deaths in the past 24 hours. 
Globally, the virus has claimed more than 3.7 million lives and infected over 172 million people. More in this report. Pandemic. Europe was battered as hard as any other continent. However, the region has fared well in its vaccination drive. Italy, which was the first European state to face the huge consequences of the pandemic, has administered record vaccinations in one day. Belgium has announced to begin vaccinating 16 to 17-year-olds against COVID-19 from the next month. Meanwhile, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson called on G7 to make a commitment to vaccinate the entire world against COVID-19 by the end of 2022. Over in the U.S., the country has so far registered more than 33 million coronavirus cases, while its death toll is approaching 600,000. The U.S. authorities have announced to keep the foreign tourists away from beaches on the D-Day anniversary. The hotel has been closed since March 1st last year, so we are reopening mid-June for a few clients who are attempting to cross the Atlantic because as of June 9, the borders will be reopening a bit. But these are people who don't know how to organize at the last minute. So if they're told that they can start traveling again from June 9, they won't all be arriving suddenly in June. So we'll have a few ones coming, but they're really an exception. Meanwhile, the U.S. will donate 750,000 COVID-19 vaccine doses to Taiwan, offering a much-needed boost to the island's fight against the pandemic. Ministers from the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Trade Group have also agreed to speed up the transit of COVID-19 vaccines and related goods at ports. In Australia, contact tracers in Victoria are trying to find the source of two COVID-19 cases which have been highly infectious in the community. In Pakistan, 76 people have lost their lives to the coronavirus over the past 24 hours. The health ministry said the countrywide death toll has surged to 21,265. The ministry has logged more than 1,600 cases overnight. The number of confirmed cases has stopped 932,000. Just over 3,400 people are in intensive care units. A total of 8.2 million vaccines have been administered in Pakistan. In India, hundreds of farmers have continued their protest outside a police station in Haryana against police raids. This comes after the authorities arrested three of their colleagues and a politician abused the farmers. Protesting farmers demanded an apology from the Vindra Singh Badli, whose political party is allied with the ruling BJP. Earlier, two FIRs had also been registered against the protesters over the clashes. For over six months, farmers have been protesting against new agriculture laws, which they say will destroy their livelihoods. However, the Narendra Modi-led government claims that the new laws will modernize India's agriculture. In India, fishermen in Thiruvananthapuram city are struggling to survive after Cyclone Taute destroyed their livelihood. More than 150 were killed after the cyclone hit India's west coast. This report has more. Cyclone Taute dissipated last month, but fishermen are still finding it hard to overcome its destruction. With rough seas and banned fishing activities, the fishermen are having a tough time with no roof over their heads. Many have been left without basic supplies like food and water. My two children are differently abled. We never thought that the cyclone would destroy our house, and now, we are living on rent with the children. We never thought that such a cyclone would come and destroy everything in five minutes. The cyclone made landfall in the western state of Gujarat. It devastated power supply in 2,400 villages in the state as thousands of electricity panels were damaged. After their houses were ravaged in the storm, the cyclone hit fishermen and their families were shifted to relief camps. It has been one month and we have not gone for catching fish because of the heavy storm. We are a total of 60 to 65 people living in Sin in Tony school. I lost all my property. The district collector has given us a warning that we should not go fishing until 9 June. So, no boat went in the sea. 
The fishing community is desperate for funds after the cyclone damaged around 1,000 fishing boats and harbor infrastructure. Candidates in Iran's presidential election have traded strong barbs in a live debate, accusing each other of treason or of lack of education. The presidential debate for the June 18 elections was focused on policies to run an economy devastated by three years of U.S. sanctions. The candidates offered two diversion visions on how the country should be run. The five hardline candidates attacked the eight-year performance of outgoing pragmatist President, President Hassan Rouhani, while the leading moderate candidate, former Central Bank Chief Abdul Nasser Hemati, blamed hardliners for heightened tensions with the West. Belarus has responded to the EU curb, saying Minsk has prepared a set of counter sanctions against the bloc. Prime Minister Roman Golovchenko said the West will not introduce any more sanctions on Belarus now. Golovchenko said the damage to the Belarusian economy from the Western sanctions could amount to 2.9% of their GDP. He said as a response, the EU will lose Belarusian market as Minsk will shift from European technology to Asian as an alternative. Meanwhile, Belarusian opposition leader Svyatlana Sikunaskaya demanded the West to impose further sanctions against Minsk. She demanded that not only businesses but also individuals from the government should be hit by Western sanctions. The EU is expected to agree by June 21st a smaller sanctions list on individuals and two entities as a quick intermediary response. And now it's time to take a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. People in the German state of Saxony and Halt vote in a decisive pre-election poll ahead of the national elections in September. The polls could deal a blow to conservative Armin Laschet hopes of succeeding Chancellor Angela Merkel. The polls show only a small lead for the Christian Democrats of Laschet and Merkel against the AFT. The far-right alternative for Germany was running just one percentage point behind in the final poll. National polls show the surging Greens almost tied with the CDU, with both holding around a quarter of the vote. The CDU's popularity has declined after 16 years of Merkel's tenure and may face a tough time in the September elections. The residents of Venice have protested against the visit of the first cruise ship since the easing of coronavirus from the city port. The protesters called on the government of Venice to act on its earlier agreed ban to big vessels. The protesters rallied on land and on small boats fluttering flags saying no big ships against the entry of large vessels into Venice. They said large vessels and ships cause great environmental hazards of pollution and underwater erosion of the city's foundations. The thing is, we are still dead. We are still here because in spite of this decree, the cruise ship, the, these giant cruise ships are still going to cross the Judeca Channel. The reason we are here is because we are citizens of Venice and we are against this passage, but we are also against a type of uh, mo like a tourism model that is destroying the city and is, um, is pushing out residents and people that want to live here. The butcher of Bosnia, former sub-military chief Ratko Miladic, will hear this decision today on his appeal against his genocide conviction in the Bosnian War. Miladic will hear the Hague Tribunal's final verdict on the 1995 Srebrenica massacre in which 100,000 were killed and 2.2 million displayed. Prosecutors alleged he personally oversaw the massacre of Srebrenica as part of ethnic cleansing to drive out Muslims and Bosnians. He was convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment in 2017 by the UN War Crime Tribunal for Genocide. Footages from the time show him handling sweets to children and taking away women by bus while men were taken to a forest and killed. The Bosnian War 1992-1995 is known to be the bloodiest war of Europe after World War II. 
NATO has expressed deep concerns over close cooperation between Russia and Belarus, as well as Russia and China. In an interview, Secretary General John Stoltenberg said that NATO is watching the global developments very keenly. Stoltenberg said Belarus is becoming more and more dependent on Russia. He added NATO is ready to protect against aggression faced by any member or ally from either Belarus or Russia. Stoltenberg further said political and military ties between Russia and China are becoming increasingly close and a serious challenge for NATO. He added that all these matters will be discussed in the upcoming NATO 2030 summit in Brussels under security threats to NATO. President Joe Biden says the United States does not seek conflict with Russia. In an opaid piece for the Washington Post, Biden reiterated the U.S. desire for a stable and predictable relationship with Moscow. He said the two countries can work together on issues like strategic stability and arms control. However, Biden added that the U.S. will not hesitate to respond to Russia's potential harmful activities. Biden said he imposed meaningful consequences for behaviors that violate U.S. sovereignty, including electoral meddling. The U.S. president said he will underscore West's commitment to human rights during his meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin. The two leaders are set to meet in Geneva on 16th of June. Former U.S. President Donald Trump has hinted his return to political stage, saying he is very much looking forward to 2024. He was addressing an enthusiastic audience at the North Carolina JOP convention dinner in Greenville. In his first major speech since he left office in January, Trump repeated his previous halves at President Joe Biden and the Democrats. The Republican also took aim at U.S. infectious disease expert Dr. Anthony Fauci and China over the coronavirus pandemic. Trump vowed to help Republicans in 2022 congressional elections and endorsed Representative Ted Budd for a Senate seat in North Carolina. And we just can't let it happen. We're going to win North Carolina's all-important U.S. Senate race. And we're going to lay the groundwork for making sure that Republicans once again carry the great state of North Carolina in a, a number, a year, that I look very much forward to, 2024. The U.S. says it is ending a long-standing practice of secretly obtaining reporters' records during probes into classified information leaks. This comes after recent revelations that the Trump administration secretly obtained phone and email records from the number of journalists. The Justice Department said it has completed a review of pending compulsory requests from reporters in league investigations. In a statement, the department said it will not seek compulsory legal process to obtain source information from journalists. Meanwhile, the White House said issuing subpoenas for reporters' records is not consistent with the Biden administration's policy. Earlier, President Biden said he will not allow the Justice Department to seize the reporters' data, describing the practice as wrong. Millions of Mexican voters are heading to the polls today to elect governors, mayors and congressional. The election largest in the country's history comes amid threats of violence by groups that do not recognize the polls. At least 90 murders and 693 aggressions against politicians and candidates have been reported in the run-up campaigns. Authorities have deployed soldiers and police in the town of Nawatson in the northeastern Mikoakon state. Political parties have disowned the region's indigenous communal council, which claims to be the local authority. Opinion polls show the ruling coalition favorites to defend their majority in the lower house of Congress. Enthusiasts from all over Russia showed off their technological creativity by participating in a drone racing competition in Moscow. The participants created their own drones and made changes to the models right on the side to improve their chances of winning. Their goal was to complete the track in the shortest possible time. In 2017, drone racing attained the status of an official support by the International Federation of Aeronautics. Following FAI's decision, drone racing was included in the All-Russian Register of Supports by the Country's Sports Ministry in 2018. 
A SpaceX cargo ship has delivered fresh supplies to the International Space Station. These include a baby bobtail squid and near microship eight legged creatures called tardy grades. The Dragon Commercial Resupply Services cargo ship carrying the supplies autonomously docked with the space station. A, re a reusable Falcon 9 carrot, a rocket carried it out of the Earth's atmosphere from the Kennedy Space Center. The resupply ship is an upgraded version that can carry more cargo than its predecessor. The squid will be used to observe symbiotic relationships between animals and microbes. When NASA sends some 2,000 tardy grades to see how they handle the stresses of microgravity. Now it's time to have a look at the weather update across the globe. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at indus.news.